great series this year. Um, we're really excited uh, to start off uh, with Professor Marie Long. Uh, she did her bachelor's at RPI and uh, uh, her PhD at MIT and a uh, postdoc that came to Yale in 2009 as uh, a professor in geology and geophysics. Uh, she's a seismologist. I am a seismologist. She's a real seismologist. Um, and uh, an appropriate, you know, I hope you stay. Remember, if you, if you, if you register, your, your registration is a raffle card, and, and an appropriate if you we have a volcano kit. And we're going to hear about volcanoes and one of the prizes for the raffle today. Okay? So, without further ado, join me in welcoming Professor Long. How's everyone doing? Can everyone hear me? Is the sound okay? All right, fantastic. I can speak up if I if needed. Okay. Uh, all right. Is the is the mic on? No. Okay. The I mean the physical switch on the on my mic is on, but I don't know if there's a setting. But at, in the meantime, I'm just going to start talking loud and say hello and welcome. And I'm really glad that you're here. I'm very excited to have an opportunity um, to talk to you today about uh, earthquakes and volcanoes and tsunamis. Oh my. So um, as Kurt said, I am a seismologist, so I'm a scientist who studies um, earthquakes, and I study the structure of the deep earth using earthquakes. And one of the classes that I teach here at Yale is called Natural Disasters. So I teach a whole semester-long class on some of the material I'm going to talk about in my talk today. Oh, that sounded good. Does that sound good? Yeah. I could stand over here. All right. Perfect. Okay. So a little bit about me. So, so Kurt in his introduction told you um, a little bit about sort of where I went to school. Um, I'm originally from Massachusetts. So I am um, a, Mass a New England native, Massachusetts native. I went to Chelmsford High School in Chelmsford, Massachusetts, um, and then went off to college and lived in a few different places while I was getting my education, and then uh, moved to Connecticut in 2009. So I've been here for almost, um, almost eight years. So one of the things that Kurt asked me to talk to you a little bit about before I start talking about earthquakes and natural disasters is how I became a scientist. And for me, the story of how I became a scientist starts with this map, OK? And this is actually, this map is also a really good introduction to my talk. So um, when I was in eighth grade, I took earth science. That was um, the science that everybody, <laughs> that everybody, maybe in everybody in Massachusetts public schools took earth science in eighth grade. And a couple of months into the school year, we did an activity on plate tectonics where we had a map and we filled out on the map the locations of earthquakes and volcanoes. And, and it showed that all of the earth, you know, many of the earthquakes and volcanoes happened on the, the boundaries of tectonic plates. So I saw a map like this that illustrates plate tectonics. And I said, that is the coolest thing I have ever heard of in my life. That is what I want to be when I grow up. I think I was in eighth grade, so I was you know, maybe only a little older than, than some of you guys, or the same age as some of you guys. And so I said, when I grow up, I am going to become a geophysicist, and I am going to study plate tectonics. And then here I am. So that's, um, that's really cool. So my eighth grade earth science class got me into being a scientist, and in particular got me into wanting to study the earth. It's an amazingly cool place. Plate tectonics, I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, the theory of plate tectonics in this talk. It's an amazingly cool scientific theory, and it lets us predict a lot about what we expect with earthquakes and volcanoes and tsunamis and natural disasters. And so that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. So usually when I give a talk like this, I like to start with um, a natural disaster, uh, an earthquake or volcanic eruption that, that was in the news recently. And unfortunately, I usually don't have to search very far to find one because geologic disasters, unfortunately, are pretty common. Um, so this is, a, this is a picture from um, the magnitude 6.2 earthquake that happened last month in Italy. Who heard about this on the news? Yeah, almost everybody. It was a pretty important event and a really devastating event. So this was a magnitude 6.2 earthquake in the Apennines Mountains in Italy. Um, it happened very shallow, which means that the earthquake waves um, were happening sort of right underneath places where people lived. And very tragically, um, there were 300 casualties associated with this event. So all the time in the news, we're reminded that we need to be aware of geologic disasters, and we need to do what we can to work to mitigate um, the damage. So this earthquake was felt very widely in Italy. This is just a map. The star is showing um, the epicenter of the earthquake. 
It was felt um, over a very wide area, from, um, basically from Naples up to Bologna, so a very wide area of the country. This is what we call a, a shake map. So this is a map that shows the colors here illustrate how violent the shaking was at different places. And you can see that at, right near the earthquake epicenter, there was um, red, red colors, so violent shaking. So about as violent as the shaking from an earthquake um, gets. Earthquakes are, are quite common in Italy. This is a, just a map of Italy showing um, the historical earthquake catalog. And in particular, over the last 20 years or so, there have been three um, quite devastating earthquakes right in that region of central Italy um, where the earthquake last month happened. So Italy is a place that has to be very aware of earthquake disasters. So oftentimes when I tell people that I'm a seismologist, they'll say, hey, I heard about, you know, a couple of earthquakes in the news last month. It seems like we've been having a lot of earthquakes lately. You know, what's going on? Is this unusual? Should, do I need to panic? And the answer really is no. Um, even though you know, a big earthquake makes the news and it feels like an unusual event, actually earthquakes are extremely common. So this is a map that I, um, that I made last night. So this is um, a view of the iris um, seismic monitor. You can Google that if you ever want to see um, the, a map of where recent earthquakes can happen um, or have happened. So all of the, the circles, so the little pink dots show all of the earthquakes that, that we know about that have happened in the, in the catalog, the historical catalog, going back to about the 1970s. And then all of the circles, these are earthquakes of magnitude four or bigger that have happened just in the last two weeks. Amazing, right? So there's you know, hundreds of dots on this map. And what this map tells us is that earthquakes are happening all the time. And we, you know, we hear about them really only when they damage human infrastructure or they, they um, have human, you know, human casualties. But the, the bottom line is that there are earthquakes happening all the time. So you know, when you have a few earthquakes that sort of make the news right in a row, that's, that's not unusual. Okay? The, the Earth is, is sort of doing this all the time, um, and this is, this is how the Earth works. The other thing that you'll notice is that these earthquakes are not distributed evenly on the surface of the Earth, right? They seem to happen uh, mostly in, in sort of lines that are outlining the boundaries of tectonic plates. And I'm going to come back to that question in a minute. One of the things um, here, this is just a, so a, a quick list of, of what we'll talk about. One of the things I want to talk about in this talk is not just say, talking about the phenomenon that we see with earthquakes and volcanoes, but also talking about the why. Why does, what, what about how the, how the Earth works gives us these earthquake and volcanic disasters? So I'm going to talk a little bit about the fuel for natural disasters. I'm going to talk about the theory of plate tectonics because it explains almost everything about earthquakes and volcanoes. And then we're going to talk some details. All right, so if you want to understand why earthquakes and volcanoes happen, why plate tectonics happens, you have to begin at the beginning. I really mean this. You have to go back to the beginning of the Earth in order to understand why we have natural disasters, OK? So this, of course, is not a photograph. We don't have any pictures of the Earth forming. This is an artist's rendering of what it might have looked like when the Earth was forming, OK? So way back 4.6 billion years ago, the Earth formed by you had the, the big solar nebula and all the planets started to form. And the way the terrestrial planets formed is you had chunks of rock that are slamming into each other like this, OK? And what happens when you have two chunks of rock that are slamming into each other like this, they have a lot of kinetic energy because they're moving very fast and they have mass. They slam into each other. They stop moving. So now they have no more kinetic energy. So what happens to that energy? We know that energy has to be conserved. So what happens? Where does that energy go? Anyone want to take a guess? You, you shout it out. I heard somebody say it. Heat. Yes, exactly. All of that kinetic energy, as all of these, these things are smashing together, all that kinetic energy goes into heat. OK, so this is what we call primordial heat. This is heat that is left over from the formation of the planet. And this heat, it is incredibly hot in the, in the Earth's interior. This is the heat that is ultimately the energy source for natural disasters. And so if you think about how much heat is the Earth giving off, the total heat output from the Earth is 46 terawatts. That's 46 trillion watts. Okay, who has a 40-watt light bulb in your house somewhere? 
Okay, an ordinary light bulb, maybe about 40 watts, that's how much power it takes. So this is trillion, a trillion times that, roughly. Okay, so that's a lot of heat, all right? Some of it, a lot of it is left over from this primordial heat. Some of it is actually generated in the planet's interior by radioactive elements that are often also giving off heat. And what the, the planet needs to do is over time, it's cooling off, it's cooling off to space, and it needs to get rid of all that heat. So one thing I'll just say is though, even though 46 terawatts sounds like a lot, if you think about how much energy, how much power the Earth is getting from the sun, it's actually a, an even bigger number. It's about 170,000 terawatts. So if you think about the fuel for disasters like hurricanes and tornadoes, sort of meteorological disasters, floods, there's actually a lot more energy available for those disasters than for geologic disasters. So it's kind of interesting, just if you think about where the energy source is for this. So I've said that the Earth needs to give off its heat, it needs to get rid of its heat, it's cooling off to space, and this is the way it happens, okay? Uh, up, up top, you'll see these are two images. Um, this is a computer model of how the Earth gets rid of its heat, and what happens is you have a process called convection. Who's ever seen a lava lamp? Have you ever seen a lava lamp? I, I don't have one. I need to get one so that I can bring it to these, these kinds of talks. A lava lamp, this is where you plug it in, it heats stuff up at the bottom and the hot stuff rises and then it cools off and then eventually it sinks again. This is called convection. Hot stuff is going up, cool stuff is going down and that's exactly what is happening in the Earth's mantle as the Earth gets rid of its heat over time. So this is just a computer movie. On the, on the left you see blue stuff, this is where hot, cold stuff goes down. Here this is yellow stuff, hot stuff goes up and the, the Earth is convecting to get rid of its heat. One point I want to make, though, is that in contrast to the lava lamp, the Earth's mantle is solid. It's not a liquid. This is a really common misperception, but the, the Earth is made of rocks. The Earth's mantle is made of rocks, and even though they're solid, they can flow. And you know what's a material that can do that that we're all kind of familiar with? Silly putty. Who's played with silly putty? Yeah, we love silly putty. So silly putty is an example of a material, it's just like the Earth's mantle. When I teach my natural disasters class, I bring it and I give it out to my students. Okay, even though it's a solid, if you pull on it, it'll stretch, it'll flow. If I leave it here and, and over the course of the talk, it'll kind of spread out into a little puddle. So the Earth's mantle, just like silly putty. All right, remember that fact. Okay, so the mantle is convecting to get rid of its heat. And the surface expression of that process of mantle convection is called plate tectonics. Okay, and this is that map that I showed that shows the boundaries of the Earth's plates. This is what's happening. This is now, instead of looking at a map view, this is now we're kind of looking at a cross section. Okay, so as the mantle is moving around, it's convecting, hot stuff is coming up, cold stuff is going down. And then at the surface, we have plate tectonics, and that's the surface expression of this mantle convection process. All right? So we have rigid plates. It's called the lithosphere. So this is the Earth's crust, and then the, the top part of the mantle as well. They're rigid, and they're moving around. OK? And at the boundaries of the plates, we have different geometries. So one is called a subduction zone, where you have a plate that's sinking back into the mantle. These are these, you know, the blue, the cold stuff going down in that movie. This is how this, this happens at the surface, where you have a, a plate that's sinking down into the mantle. We also have spreading centers. This is where two plates are spreading apart. Two plates are, are moving apart from each other like that and you're making new oceanic crust at a, under the, the ocean. And then you can also have what's known as a, a transform boundary. So there's one right up there, a transform boundary. This is where two plates move side to side, okay? So three types of plate boundaries. Convergent, this is where plates come together, like that subduction zone. Divergent, this is where the plates come apart. And transform, this is where the plates go past each other. That's really, if you remember those things, three types of plate boundaries, you are going to understand what kinds of earthquakes and what kinds of volcanoes happen where on the Earth. So that's kind of the key idea in this talk. All right, so remember that. This is the same thing that was the cartoon view. Now this is the map view. Okay, so again, we've seen a version of this map already. This is showing the boundaries of all the tectonic plates. All right, where do we live? We live in Connecticut, right? Where's Connecticut on that map? 
Are we on a plate boundary? No, we are right in the middle of the, um, of the North American plate. Okay, so that means that we don't have really large and destructive earthquakes here. We do occasionally have small ones. Does anyone remember when there was the earthquake sequence in Plainfield, Connecticut, about a year and a half ago? Magnitude 3.3, .3, so not a huge one. We occasionally have earthquakes here, but for the most part we don't have big ones because we're in the middle of a plate. But there are lots of places that are on a plate boundary, right? So um, if you live in Seattle, for example, or if you live in California, or if you live in southern Alaska, you are on a plate boundary. Then you need to worry about what are the earthquake and volcano hazards associated with that. Okay, so again, in map view, this is showing the locations of, of the plates and a little bit about how they move. The Pacific plate is the largest tectonic plate on Earth. It's moving this way in kind of a you know, northwest direction. And again, you have convergent plate boundaries where two plates come together, and one will often dive beneath the other in a subduction zone. You have divergent plates. Thank you. Awesome. Now I have the laser. I have the power. Perfect. OK. So now, so you have a transfer boundary. So Southern California is an example of that, the San Andreas Fault, where two plates are going past each other. And you have a divergent boundary, such as here. This is the East Pacific Rise. This plate moves this way. This plate move this, moves this way. And you make new oceanic crust in between. OK, one more time. I'm, I'm, I'm repeating this because I want you to remember. Transform fault, two plates go past each other. This is a, a subduction zone or a convergent boundary. The two plates come together. And then this is a spreading center or a divergent boundary. Two plates move apart. All right, so coming back to how this ties into earthquakes and volcanoes and tsunamis, the thing to remember is that earthquakes and volcanoes, not all of them, but almost all of them, happen on plate boundaries, OK? So if you live near a plate boundary, you need to understand what are the earthquake and volcano hazards. And if you don't, like us here in Connecticut, then you know, for the most part, we don't need to lose sleep over this, OK? <laughs> so yes. As I, there, again, we, we can, we do have some earthquakes here in New England. They are not the biggest and most damaging ones. I don't lose sleep over this, so you shouldn't either. OK. So this is why plate tectonics is important if you want to understand disasters. Understanding what kind of plate boundary you're on tells us what events are likely in terms of earthquakes and volcanoes and what sort of events they're likely to be. All right? OK, plate tectonics. So now let's talk about earthquakes. All right, this is what I do. I'm a seismologist. I study earthquakes and earth structure. So what is an earthquake? What is happening in the ground when you have an earthquake? This is how it works, OK? Say you have a fault here. You have a, a very convenient stone wall built across this fault. You have sheep here. OK, so you have one plate here. You have one plate here. These plates are moving, right? That's the theory of plate tectonics. It tells us that the plates are moving around with respect to each other on the Earth's surface. OK, so you have, in this example, this plate is, is moving like this. This plate's moving like that. You're, the plates are moving, but right at the fault, you have two blocks of rock pressed together, and they get stuck, OK? It, they're stuck together. There's friction. You know, it's just like if you try to move your refrigerator. You know, you try to, the fridge that's been sitting in your kitchen for like 20 years, and you try to move it, you, you, you push on it, you push on it. It's stuck. There's friction, right? There's friction between your fridge and the ground. Eventually, though, the far field motion of the plates overcome that friction, and the rock breaks, OK? And you get sudden motion along the fault here, and it, and it breaks, and that's an earthquake, OK? You can demonstrate that pretty simply. I have a little, I'm coming around here. I have a little demonstration here, OK? So what I have is I have a little wooden board that has uh, sandpaper on it, so it has a lot of friction. There's a brick, OK? So I'm representing another tectonic plate. Do I look like a tectonic plate? Yes, thank you. OK, so I'm going to pull here. I'm going to hold this in place. I'm going to pull. All right, I'm the tectonic plate. I'm moving, I'm moving, I'm moving. The brick isn't moving. Brick isn't moving. And then you get an earthquake. OK, as soon as the, the motion of the tectonic plate overcomes the friction between the two blocks of rock, you get an earthquake. OK, so I'm going to pull. Another earthquake. Another earthquake. Another earthquake. OK, that's basically how it works. All right, and again, if you want to prove this to yourself, you can go to your kitchen and try to move your fridge. It's not going to be easy, okay? 
So that's what an earthquake is. That's how an earthquake happens. All right. So I've just said that we have earthquakes on plate boundaries. Turns out we get different types of earthquakes on different types of plate boundaries, OK? Spreading center is in the middle of a plate. They're, the plates are thin. The plates are hot. The plates are weak. We get wimpy little earthquakes there. Nothing to worry about. Plus, they're under the bottom of the ocean where nobody lives. I don't know anybody that lives on the bottom of the ocean, do you? No. OK. Oh, SpongeBob. All right, you got me. SpongeBob needs to worry about these. All right. We have strike slip faults where, where the two, let me find one here. Yeah, so the, where the two plates go past each other. Here we get moderately strong earthquakes. Subduction zones. This is where you have a plate that's thick, it's cold, it has very high friction, very high strength. It's very strong in compression, like a lot of materials are. This is, so it can resist the motion of the plates in between the earthquakes. This is where you get the big guys, OK? Subduction zones are where we have the biggest earthquakes. All right, so let's take a little tour around the globe and see in what places we can expect what kinds of earthquakes. This, again, is a map of the western US. All right, this is the San Andreas Fault. This is one of the really famous faults that we have here in the US. This is a transform fault, OK? So it's in that middle category where you can get moderately large earthquakes, but not the biggest that we get ever on the Earth, OK? So that's something to keep in mind. So here you have the North American plate that's moving like this. Pacific plates moving like this. Plates are moving past each other. And where that you overcome that friction and the rock breaks, that's an earthquake. So along the San Andreas Fault, this is a place where we have to worry about earthquakes. And people who live in California spend a lot of time and energy worrying about this. A lot of times we see this in the movies. <laughs> who saw San Andreas? Not the most accurate scientific depiction. <laughs> OK, it's a fun movie. Um, but so in San Andreas, I think there was, what, like a magnitude 10 earthquake or something? OK, first of all, that's bigger than earthquakes can get. But also, that's, that's not accurate, because the biggest earthquakes we would expect to have in a subduction zone, not in LA where the rock lives and flies helicopters around. So there you go. <laughs> All right. So to, to just look at a few examples of, of transform fault earthquakes, um, the Loma Prieta earthquake in 1989, this is known as the World Series earthquake because it took place during the World Series and they had to cancel or, or move a couple uh, baseball games. Um, this was a magnitude 6.9 earthquake. Um, so that, you know, again, 6.9, that's pretty big, but it's not as big as they can get. I'm going to show you some pictures from some really big ones. Um, and unfortunately, there were some significant casualties from this event because there was a very, you know, famous and very tragic collapse of a section, um, a section of elevated highway. So when these events happen, they definitely can cause damage um, to our infrastructure. Another more recent and very tragic event, um, example of a, a transform fault, what we call strike-slip earthquake was the, um, the January 2010 earthquake in Haiti. Haiti is located um, right here in the, in the Caribbean Sea, which is a very complicated region. Lots of earthquakes. You have a subduction zone over here in this part of the Caribbean. Um, and then on the island of Hispaniola, in, of Hispaniola you have uh, several of these transform faults that run right through, including this one. This is the Enriquillo Fault. Um, sorry, this is the... Yes, the Enriquillo Fault here. This is the Septentrional Fault up here. And unfortunately, right under the city of Port-au-Prince, which is a very densely populated city, on January 12th, there was a magnitude 7 earthquake, very shallow, caused a huge amount of damage to poorly built infrastructure. And this was actually one of the, the five deadliest earthquakes in human history. Um, the number of casualties is not well known, but it was very large. Now, a magnitude 7 earthquake is not the biggest kind of earthquake that we can get, right? But if it happens right under a big city that has infrastructure that was not designed to withstand earthquakes, then that you can have a lot, you can have a lot of you know, very tragic outcomes there, OK? Seismologists sort of have a saying that earthquakes don't kill people, buildings kill people. <laughs> And it's, this is a really good illustration of that. There is a lot of not very well-built infrastructure, and that's sort of where you get very tragic results. OK, so we've talked about transform faults. Now um, we're going to talk about the, conver the big guys. So these are the convergent margins. You have two plates coming together. There's actually three types of convergent zones. So you can have um, 
Ocean, ocean, where two oceanic plates are coming together. Uh, the Aleutian Islands are an example of that. You can have ocean continents. So South America, the western margin of South America is, is an example of that. This is the Nazca plate. It's subducting beneath South America. And then you have, can have continents, continents collisions, like here in the Himalayas, where India is slamming into Eurasia here. So all three of these types of convergent margins can cause very big earthquakes. Um, India, the India-Eurasia collision is a, a very nice example. You have the Indian uh, landmass has moved to the north over about the last 70 million years or so, and now it's slamming into the main part of Eurasia. This is why the Himalayan mountains are there, and it's also a place where we can unfortunately expect to have very big earthquakes. And we saw that again recently. Okay, over the past uh, you know, decade or 15 years or so, there have been major earthquakes um, in India, Pakistan, and then a, a little over a year ago in Nepal, where there was um, an earthquake here. Oh, this is a, describing the 2001. But we, uh, we remember just a little over a year and a half ago, the 2015 magnitude 7.8 earthquake um, in Nepal. This, this caused a lot of damage in Kathmandu. It triggered a landslide on Mount Everest. Again, a lot, you know, we, we expect to have earthquake hazards in this region, but unfortunately, this is a region that has had very rapid population growth, and building codes, you know, are, are either weak or they're not enforced well. So it's a place where there's large population and infrastructure that is often not built um, with the goal of, of withstanding an earthquake in mind. And again, this is a, a place where we can sort of use our knowledge of plate tectonics to maybe you know, mitigate the hazard a little bit. We know here that we should, you know, we should build buildings that can withstand an earthquake. All right, the largest earthquakes on the planet, not San Andreas, unlike what the rock will tell you, but they are at what we call ocean subduction zones. So here you have an oceanic plate and then you have a continent over here. You have volcanoes, we're gonna talk about that in a second, but you also get very large very de devastating earthquakes. These are the big guys, okay? These are your magnitude nines, 9.2, even up to 9.5, which is the largest earthquake that has ever been recorded by, um, by seismic instruments. So there's, this is just a list of some very notable ones. Um, the very recent, the recent magnitude nine, at this point was five years ago, um, was the 2001 earthquake in Japan that of course, you know, got a lot of, of attention. And again, these are the big guys. So where are these big subduction zones? Where are the places where we have to worry about this? This is mostly along the ring of fire. So there's a ring of subduction systems all around the Pacific. There are also other ones. I showed the example of Italy. That's a subduction zone. Um, there's here, we have one in the, in the Caribbean. But in the, for the most part, it's around this ring of fire. So these are the places that need to worry, or, or really, I don't mean worry, I mean prepare for a magnitude nine earthquake. Okay, and you'll notice that here in the U.S. we have several places that fall into this category. So here, this is the Pacific Northwest. The Juan de Fuca plate is subducting beneath North America, so cities like Seattle and Portland, um, Vancouver are, are uh, exposed to that hazard. And then here in Alaska, we also um, have, a, have a, um, a subduction zone. An associated hazard that is associated with these very large earthquakes that happen at, at an oceanic subduction zone is a tsunami, okay? This is a little cartoon of how a tsunami is generated. I'll play this a couple times. You have, here's your, your plate going down. Whoa, this is fast. There is the earthquake, and what happens is you have the earthquake, and it displaces the water column, and you get a tsunami. So then the tsunami waves spread apart from the place where there was the earthquake, and they spread across the ocean basin. Okay, I'm gonna play this one more time. I think I'm gonna play this one more time. There we go. All right, so here's the plate going down. This is locked, and then all of a sudden, you're gonna have the earthquake. There it goes. This top plate pops up, and it displaces a whole bunch of water, okay? And then that causes the tsunami, all right? This is another thing that was inaccurate about San Andreas, the movie. Do you, those of you who saw it, remember how there was a huge tsunami? Yeah, okay, so tsunamis, in order to trigger a tsunami, you need that top plate in that cartoon to pop up. You need vertical displacement of a column of water, okay? San Andreas is what type of a plate boundary? Transform, the plates are going like this, okay? With this kind of earthquake, do you think you're gonna displace any water up? No, San Andreas, thumbs down on the science. <laughs> All right, 
So a few examples of um, famous tsunamis. So there was a very um, devastating tsunami in Alaska in 1946. There are very sort of dramatic pictures. Here's, here's a lighthouse before the tsunami. This is the lighthouse after the tsunami. So this one was, was um, very destructive. Um, and this tsunami actually caused destruction here in, um, in Alaska, but then the wave traveled all the way across the Pacific Ocean Basin, and um, there was damage. This is another very dramatic photo. Damage, and people unfortunately lost their lives in Hilo, Hawaii. And um, after uh, this, this event, and then the, the, um, the Chile earthquake in 1960, this is the largest earthquake ever recorded by seismometers. So this is a magnitude 9.5 subduction earthquake. This is about as big as they get. Um, this also triggered a tsunami. The tsunami continued all the way to Japan, all the way across the Pacific Ocean Basin, and there were fatalities in, in Japan. So these kinds of events, really triggered um, a lot of people to worry about, well, how can we have a tsunami warning system? Okay, because the tsunami wave takes a pretty long time to propagate across an ocean basin. And so in response to these events, there was, they set up the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center, which is now responsible for issuing tsunami warnings so that if there's an earthquake in, say, Chile, people in Hawaii will be warned and they can evacuate and they can get to higher ground. So that was a good result that came out of some of these Pacific Ocean basins. Unfortunately, there was not a similar effort in the Indian Ocean to set up a tsunami warning system. And in uh, 2004, there was a very devastating uh, magnitude 9, I think it was about a magnitude 9.2. Yeah, it ranges a little bit. Well, seismologists argue a little bit over exactly what was the magnitude of this earthquake for some sort of complicated technical reasons. Um, but this was a massive earthquake over a magnitude nine, caused a huge amount of damage very close to the, um, to the epicenter, but it also triggered um, a major tsunami. There was 20 meters of uplift on the seafloor. It displaced a huge amount of the water column, and it triggered a tsunami that traveled across the Indian Ocean Basin. This is a, a scientific model of that tsunami, so the earthquake um, ruptured. Actually, the fault that this ruptured was enormous. It, it ruptured a huge portion of the subduction zone here, uh, over a thousand kilometers, triggered this, this tsunami wave that traveled across the Indian Ocean Basin. It hit here in, in Thailand. It hit certainly here in Indonesia. It hit a lot of the coast of India, Sri Lanka. And actually, as there were, there were um, casualties due to this as far away as, as Africa, um, Kenya, Kenya and Tanzania. Um, and What's very frustrating to me as a scientist is that um, there was no tsunami warning system in place. And, and we you know, have the scientific knowledge to predict that when you have a magnitude 9 subduction zone earthquake like this, there is very likely to be a tsunami. The tsunami wave took hours to, to get to places like India and Sri Lanka. You know, very close to the, to the earthquake epicenter, it's hard to issue a warning because the tsunami happens very soon after the earthquake. But far away, that's not the case. And so it's very frustrating to me that there was not in place a tsunami warning system at the time in the Indian Ocean, because that could have saved many lives. It's another example of how we can use the knowledge that we have by understanding plate tectonics and understanding what kind of earthquakes we might have in what different region of a way that we can mitigate the hazard um, from natural disasters. So you probably you know, may have remembered seeing some of these very terrible and dramatic um, pictures of the tsunami waves um, on, the, on the news. So again, just to wrap up on earthquakes, the real bad ones, the magnitude nines that trigger the tsunamis and cause a lot of damage, subduction zones, convergent margins where you have two plates coming together. Okay, and luckily here in Connecticut, we're far away from a plate boundary. All right, next up, volcanoes. Who's excited for volcanoes? Yeah, we all are. All right. So I'm going to come back to this map. You've seen this map several times before. Okay, all the yellow dots are the earthquakes. All the little uh, red triangles are the volcanoes. And what do we notice? What's the relationship between volcanoes and plate boundaries? That's where they happen, right? So almost all, 90% of the volcanoes happen on the plate boundaries. But there are some exceptions, right? What's a famous exception that we kind of might? Hawaii. Hawaii, yes, that's the most famous one of all. So here's Hawaii. Hawaii is right here in the middle of the Pacific Plate. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, where is the nearest plate boundary? I don't even know. Probably over here. This is many thousands of kilometers away. So we're going to talk about Hawaii and why we have volcanoes there in a second. All right, so what is a volcano? What is happening in the Earth when you have a, a volcano? All right, the idea is that somehow you have melting of mantle rocks. Remember, I told you the mantle is a solid. It is not a liquid. There is not a vast ocean of liquid magma everywhere in the mantle, okay? It actually takes some doing to take a mantle rock and melt it, okay? And in fact, let's do a very quick little primer on the physics of how you melt a rock, okay? There are three ways to melt a mantle rock, all right? What, if, what is the way, if you want to melt something, say you're baking cookies, you have a stick of butter, you need to melt it, what do you do to melt it? You can shout it out. Heat it. You heat it, exactly. You heat it on the stove, you put it in the microwave, you heat it, okay? That is not how mantle rocks melt, for the most part, okay? It's actually really rare to have melting in the earth due to heating, okay? Interesting, right? What's another way to melt something, all right? Say it's, um, it's a cold winter day, we just had this like massive nasty ice storm, your driveway is a mess, what do you do? You put salt on it, exactly. So another way to melt things is to sort of add impurities to it, and that's going to change the melting temperature of the material. Okay, so in the earth, one of the things that we, well the earth adds, is actually a little bit of water. You add a little bit of water to a rock, you lower the melting temperature and you can melt it. Okay, what's a third way of melting something? This one's maybe a little less obvious because it's not a really great like real world example. All right, think if you have a very, a, an earth, um, a rock deep in the earth, it's under really high pressure. It turns out if I bring that rock up to the earth's surface and the pressure goes down, you can get what's called decompression melting. So if you change the pressure and then the rock has the same amount of sort of heat and energy, it will melt if you bring it up to a lower pressure, okay? So you can heat it, you can add impurities, or you can change the pressure. Those are the three ways to melt a rock, and heating it, that is usually not how the, how the earth works, okay? Now you know everything about mantle melting, so now we can talk about volcanoes. All right, so we get volcanoes in a couple different places. One is this mid-ocean ridge, okay? So this is a divergent plate boundary. You have one plate moving this way, one plate moving this way, as the plates move apart, you have, you have rocks that come up to sort of replace the stuff that's moving away. So right underneath the ridge, you have rising rocks. And as you change the pressure, they melt and they cause volcanoes, OK? This is, the, this is a movie. This is really cool, OK? This is a movie of mid-ocean ridge um, volcanism, OK? These are called pillow basalts. So this movie was captured by a, um, you know, a ship that has, a, has a, an ROV that can go down to the, um, take people down to the, to the bottom of the sea, like SpongeBob, okay? So this is pillow basalt. So what happens is you have this sort of runny magma that comes out onto the earth, um, onto the surface, onto the, the bottom of the seafloor. It hits the cold water and it cools, it freezes, okay? So you get this kind of neat, really neat, like, pillow-like structure, okay? The magma comes out, it cools, and you get these pillows, all right? Anyone want to see an actual pillow of basalt lava? You don't have to go to the bottom of the sea to do it. All you have to do is go to the target in Meriden, okay? I'm, I'm not making this up. Go behind the target, and there's, a, there's like kind of an exposed cliff. You can see frozen pillow of basalt that formed during the breakup of Pangaea 200 million years ago right here in Connecticut, okay? So you do not have to be SpongeBob to actually see this. Target in Meriden, okay? All right, so an important thing about the lavas, you guys are all gonna go to Target this afternoon now. I should be getting, I should be getting paid for this. All right, so an important thing about the lavas that you have under the seafloor is that they're pretty runny, okay? So it's like the lavas that you get under the seafloor that are made by melting the mantle rock right beneath the ridge, okay? It's kind of like, this is caro syrup, okay? It's kind of like this. So I'm going to pour this into, the, into a bowl, okay? It's runny. It's gooey, all right? This is, that, this is the kind of the, the consistency. I mean, of course, it's hotter, you know, it's hotter like this than this. This is not a, a perfect analogy. But you have kind of this gooey, runny, lava, okay? And, and we have this 
um, under the seafloor in these pillow basalt lavas. And then we also have these in places like Hawaii. I promise to tell you about Hawaii. Here it is. Hawaii is what's known as a hot spot, okay? And you have hot, you do have some hot, hot material. Scientists argue a lot over this, whether or not it comes all the way from the core mantle boundary or whether it's shallower. But most scientists, including myself, think that it probably comes all the way from the core mantle boundary. It's a little hotter than the mantle around it, so it comes up. And then it, 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 but it's not molten. So in the, in the bottom part of the mantle, it's not molten. But it, as it comes up, it's changing its pressure. You get this deep, you know, decompression, depressurization, melting. You get melting. And then as the plate moves over the hot spot, you get a series of volcanoes. Okay, so here, this is Hawaii. So here's the big island of Hawaii. I was there with my natural disasters class this past March. It's awesome. And then going away, you have this line of islands that get progressively older as the plate has moved over this hot spot. All right? And in Hawaii, the kind of volcanism that you get, the kind of lava that you get, is this runny, you know, it pours easily. It's this runny magma. It makes these basalt rocks. Um, and you can, if you hit it on the right day, um, you can actually go, and if you get the right permits, to don't actually do this. Get a guide to, get a guide to take you if you ever go. All right? People get stupid and go on the lava when they shouldn't. But if you are a trained geophysicist, like my colleague Dave, Dave Berkovici, who teaches in the geology department, you can actually go up to this runny lava, and you can take a little sample of it. This is what, uh, what Dave did. He poked a stick in the lava, and you can get your very own basaltic rock. Okay? But the point is, is that this kind of volcano, it's not that dangerous. You can kind of you know, walk up to the lava. It's runny. It's flowing. You know, if it gets too close, you can walk away from it, okay? So this, this kind of thing, it's very, it, it, it certainly can damage infrastructure. So this is a lava flow that is slowly eating this road. This is a bunch of Yale students that are hiking on the lava. Um, but this, this, kind of, this kind of volcano tends to not have fatalities, right? Because people can evacuate, all right? Hawaii is a good example. You get these really dramatic, like, fountains of lava, you get these rivers of lava. Again, it's just like the caro syrup example. Um, and oftentimes, it does damage infrastructure. So back in uh, 2014, there was you know, a, a, an excursion of the lava into places where people had built their homes, but the people were able to evacuate. Okay, So these tend to not be that dangerous. Um, this is another example. This is Iceland, Ayafjaya Jokul. I practiced that last night. <laughs> the name of the volcano. Um, this is another example of a volcano that sort of erupts with this runny lava. This particular um, example actually also had a steam explosion. So again, people were able to evacuate. But this steam explosion put a lot of ash up into the atmosphere. And a lot of planes actually were grounded because jet engines can't fly through ash, turns out. OK? Um, we also have some of these hot spot volcanoes here in the US. Yellowstone is a great example. This is not right on a plate boundary. Um, Yellowstone has a very you know, kind of complicated um, history of eruption. They actually have had, um, in, the, in the geologic past, about 600,000 years ago, these super eruptions. So this is potentially a hazard for the Western US, but it does not erupt very often. I mean, of course, there are small eruptions, like the geysers, Old Faithful is there, but the catastrophic eruptions in these hotspot regions are not very common. OK, so now we're going to talk about subduction zones. So just like with earthquakes, remember we said earthquakes, the big guys, the magnitude 9s, those are in subduction zones. It's true for, um, for volcanoes too, OK? So the idea is you have the plate going down like this. The plate has water in it, so it's been sitting on, on the, the bottom of the seafloor for a long time. It now has a bunch of minerals that have water in their crystal structure locked into them. Those rocks get down. The water gets cooked out of them. You put water into these rocks right here in the, in the wedge. Remember how you throw salt on your driveway and it melts? You put water into these mantle rocks, and they melt. And then you get volcanoes, OK? But at a subduction zone, that magma has to travel up through this overriding continental plate. And what happens is that it melts some of the material around it. And you get a melt that's very different than the basaltic magma that you get under you know, the pillow basalts under the ocean. Here you get what's called a silica-rich magma. Okay? Remember how I said the basalt magma was like the caro syrup? All right? The silica-rich magma 
is more like this. So what is this? Pizza dough, okay? Anyone hungry for pizza? Now I am. I'm gonna go get pizza for lunch. Okay, if the, if the basalt runny magma is the caro syrup, this is the magma that you make at these, um, at these volcanoes in a subduction zone, okay? It's thick, it's pasty, it is not runny. And you imagine this lump of pizza dough coming out of a volcano, it's gonna get stuck, it's, gonna, it's not gonna wanna just run smoothly, and instead, what happens is the magma gets stuck in the volcano and it builds up pressure. It, you get water, you get volatiles, and you have an explosive eruption because this magma can't flow nicely like the basaltic magma, okay? So because of this, this is why we get the big catastrophic volcanic eruptions, all right? So this is basically what I just said. They're richer in silica. They're thicker and pasty. Um, they plug up the volcanoes just like pizza dough. Okay, so this is why you get catastrophic eruptions, okay? Because you have this pasty stuff, it's full of water, right? I just said that the way you make this is you put water into mantle rocks, okay? So you have this pasty stuff, it plugs up, you're building up water, you're building up water, and it's very much like if you take a bottle of soda, you shake it up, what would happen? If I were to unload, what do you think would happen? Shout it out. What's going to happen? No. All right. Should I do it? Yeah. Do you dare me? Yeah. Do you triple dog dare me? Yeah. All right. For science, I'm doing it. I'm going to make sure I'm away from the electronics. <laughs> See, the things we do for science. <laughs> OK. So that is what happens when you have a giant volcano at a subduction zone, okay? Would you want to be there when that giant volcano explodes at a subduction zone? No, I would not, okay? These are examples of famous, where they're called stratovolcanoes in subduction zones. This is where you get these explosive eruptions. I want to leave time for questions, so I'm not going to go through this in, in detail. Um, but I'm going, to, I'm going to show some cool pictures and so, show some cool examples, okay? This is what's known as a, a Plinian eruption, named for Pliny the Younger. Um, the, the example, so he uh, witnessed the eruption of Vesuvius in the year 79. This is what these look like, okay? The thick, pasty magma plugs up the volcano. You build up this pressure. You build up all this water and steam and ash, and then eventually you get this giant explosion, okay? So you get this explosive, big ash cloud that goes up into the atmosphere. And unfortunately, what can happen is that you get this big ash cloud, it goes up into the atmosphere, it cools off a tiny bit, and then you get a collapse. The whole hot ash cloud collapses down the side of the volcano. This is known as a pyroclastic flow. This is a very scary picture. Of, um, this is the eruption of Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines in 1991, of this truck trying to race away from this pyroclastic flow cloud. This is where the hazards come from with these kinds of volcanoes, okay? Where the, the city of Pompeii was destroyed by this kind of pyroclastic um, flow, you know, back in the, year, um, in the year 79. Tambora, another volcano in Indonesia, another famous example of this. Um, closer to home here in the U.S., this is the Caribbean. Um, we have uh, a series of volcanoes here. This is a subduction zone. Subduction zones are where the action happens. Um, a very famous example of this, Mount Pele in Martinique. So it had a catastrophic eruption in 1902. There was a direct blast pyroclastic flow that came down the mountain, destroyed the city of Mount Pele, and there were two survivors in the whole city. Okay, almost everyone, uh, everyone died. And there's kind of a tragic backstory about how the governor prevented everybody from evacuating. So kind of demonstrates that you need to have good disaster management. All right. This is Mount Pele today. Um, this is what it looks like. I took this picture because uh, we took a natural disasters field trip. You can hike to the top. It's beautiful. Um, the Caribbean, I mentioned the Caribbean partly because it's fairly close to us, but it really is a big center for, um, for sort of volcano hazards. This is the island of Dominica, beautiful place. Very small island. I think it's about the size of um, the island of Martha's Vineyard here in, in uh, New England. It has nine active volcanoes, and it has a population of people that live, Roseau here is the big city, that live right 
surrounded by a ring of these volcanoes. This is a subduction zone. These have the potential to have a very catastrophic eruption. So again, we're using plate tectonics to understand what kind of volcanic hazard people in Dominica need to plan for. Um, another neat thing that you see there is you have a lot of these steam eruption volcanoes, and you can go to um, what is known as the boiling lake. It's called the boiling lake because it is a boiling lake. The lake is actually boiling. It is extremely cool. Um, you can kind of see, I took these pictures, they're not that great, but um, this is just another kind of example of how the volcano, all this heat from the, the um, volcanic rocks at depth kind of come up. Um, this is just a gratuitous, beautiful picture of, um, of the Calbuco volcano in, in Chile, and then also Mount St. Helens. I know some of us in the room, um, some of you in the room actually, not me, remember the Mount St. Helens. I was two. Remember the Mount St. Helens eruption. Um, that was a good example here in, in the continental U.S. of this kind of catastrophic volcanic eruption. All right, I'm going to summarize, and then I'll take a couple questions. Geologic disasters due to plate tectonics. The reason that this happens is the Earth is cooling to space. Okay? The Earth is getting rid of its heat by convection. That's why we have plate tectonics. That's why we have earthquake and volcanoes and tsunami disasters. Okay? If you understand plate tectonics and you understand what type of earthquake and what type of volcano you might get in a different place and why, that goes a long way towards planning for natural disasters, okay? And the big bad guy here is really subduction zones, okay? Subduction zones where one plate is diving under another. This is where you get the big earthquakes. This is where you get the catastrophic volcanoes. So in terms of thinking about hazards, that's, that's the bad guy that we have to plan for. And I'll just end on a positive note, okay? Because I know there's sort of a lot, anytime you talk about natural disasters, it's kind of a lot of, you know, death and destruction and, and dramatic pictures. But, but I'm hopeful, okay? I'm going to end on a positive note because I am an optimist about this. If we understand and plan for disasters, we can mitigate a lot of their hazard. And that's why the scientists like me who study plate tectonics and who study the Earth's interior, that's why we do what we do because it's going to help us to mitigate and plan for these disasters so they don't do as much damage to human life and infrastructure. I'll stop there. You guys have been a great audience. Thank you very much. I know, I, t I talked until noon. I couldn't help myself. We got a lottery afterwards. Great volcano. So, first question, right over here. All right, if we're, if we're going to have questions, you've got to be a little quiet so I can hear. Okay, thank you. What is the cause of the hot spot under Hawaii? Why doesn't the temperature just equalize over there? Yes. <laughs> you have asked, you should be a geophysicist because you have just asked a fundamental question that we do not know the answer to and that a lot of people, including me, are trying to study. So we don't really know. So, the, so the, I mean, the theory, so the, I mean, the reason that some, sometimes you have hot upwellings, right, is because of convection, okay? So, so you're always going to have some hot stuff coming up as the earth, as the mantle convects and gets rid of its heat. Why they seem to stay in place for a long time, that is, not a, that is a great question that we don't understand. And, and why, you know, why do they form where they do? If they're really coming from the core mantle boundary, why do they form where, where they do? And there are a bunch of hypotheses, but this is actually a question that I actively research and a lot of geophysicists do. So you should become a geophysicist. Ooh, we got someone yeah, all right, back there. Oh my gosh, okay. Well, here's the thing. If you want. Yeah, okay, exactly. Natural disasters, GNG 100. <laughs> yeah, so if you want to you see lava today, you have to go to a place like Hawaii or Iceland. But this is cool. If you want to see rocks that are lava that has cooled off, lava from a volcano that has cooled from long ago, you can go up to East Rock in New Haven or West Rock. Or you can go up to Sleeping Giant, and these are, these are rocks that are made, these were volcanoes, not the big explosive kind, but the kind of runny basalt kind, okay? So if you want to go get your own volcanic rock this afternoon, you can go to Sleeping Giant or East Rock, and you can pick up a, a lava rock there. But it's, it's, it, was, it was a volcano a long time ago. 
but still, it's not bad. Yes? What's the nature of the Yosemite caldera? Um, good question. I do not know very much. You mean Yosemite or Yellowstone? Yellowstone. Yellowstone. Okay, I was going to say, I do not know a ton about Yosemite. So it is, um, it is one of these, what, the term is a super caldera. There's a, um, another one in, in, um, in uh, Toba in, the, in Indonesia. It is, again, not well known why you get these enormous, they're called super, super caldera explosions in some regions and not in others. But we actually know pretty well that um, about 600,000 years ago, there was a massive, I forget exactly the size of the caldera, but it's huge. And then there was the ash fall from that super caldera eruption covered much of the continental United States. So these eruptions are potentially massive. Again, they're rare, so please don't lose sleep over this. Um, but, you know, it's the kind of thing that, that in, the, in the geologic past, you know, there were some, some, thing, some things that happened that would really affect human life and infrastructure if they happened again today. Uh, one last one right yeah. here. Yes. Why are there different? That's a great question. There you get different kinds of lava because rocks melt under different circumstances, okay? So under a mid-ocean ridge, the rocks come up, the pressure is low, and they melt. And that's it. So they, it makes the runny lava. Under a subduction zone, the rocks are melting, and they're melting all of that silica-rich continental crust above them. The silica chains, they're little, on a, if you think of what, what the molecules, what the atoms look like, they make these little, almost like pyramids, tetrahedra, and then they stick together in these long chains. And those chains of silica molecules that get into the lava is what makes it like this. Okay, it's like the chains of molecules make it sticky and, and runny. And you don't have those silica chains in the, in the, um, the mid-ocean ridge magnets. That's an excellent question. All right, if you want to come and take geochemistry sometime, you'll learn all the details. One last one, yes? My question is, were there any predictions for specific tsunami warning? Yes. Because the tsunami warning was not Yes, so, so I want to make a little bit of a distinction between prediction. I didn't talk about this at all. Prediction is a, a word that people like me kind of hate, <laughs> all right, because we can, particularly earthquakes, we cannot predict earthquakes. So we cannot, we can, we can make forecast and say, okay, there's a 50% you know, of chance of this happening over the next decade or whatever. We can't predict earthquakes. Um, I, my own opinion is we will never be able to predict earthquakes. But that's, my, that's my opinion. But what we can do for tsunamis is when, when an earthquake happens, we know it pretty quickly because we have seismometers all over the globe. We can use that data in real time to, to, to determine, ah, oh, there was a magnitude 9 earthquake. And then you can warn people. You know, you can, you know, pick up the phone, or of course now it's all automated and by computers, but you can warn, you know, say if there's an earthquake in Chile, you can warn Hawaii and then and say in five hours there's gonna be a tsunami. So they set off, you know, they set off the sirens, everybody knows to evacuate. The key is that you have to have the infrastructure in place to do that warning. And I think it's really important that you know, we invest, we as sort of taxpayers, invest in that infrastructure um, because it saves lives. Thank you all for coming. You're a terrific audience. Thank you.